These sessions were recorded at the St. Therese Institute of Faith and Mission in Bruno, Saskatchewan, a place that is dedicated to the intellectual, spiritual, and human formation of young Catholic adults. Please note that all of the resource materials that were made available to the participants at this conference are also available to you through the links in the description of this video. Thank you and God bless. How do we go about building virtue? And how do we be strategic about it so that it actually gets us to where we want to go? Right? So you're not putting too much oil in your tank of oil. Um, one of the biggest things that I really want to push and I really want you to understand about virtue, okay? Because this, I, this, this is where I find people get stuck the most, okay? Virtue is not the behavior itself, okay? Virtue is a disposition. And we confirm that disposition through the action, okay? So the, the action confirms the disposition of the heart, right? If I told you that I just saved $10,000, I put $10,000 in the bank. Your automatic reaction to that might be to just say, well, good job. That's quite good of you. That shows temperance. That shows self-control, right? That shows prudence. That's virtuous. But what if my heart put $10,000 away because I was anxious? Because I was anxious about the future? Because I didn't trust that I would be provided for? And actually, my heart's disposition was a vice of self-reliance. All of a sudden, that same behavior on the outside might look good, but that heart, that heart's not in the right place. Same thing. Maybe I told you I had a piece of cake on Monday. I did. <laughs> it was delicious. Your automatic reaction might be, oh, you know, cake, cake is unhealthy. Maybe you shouldn't be eating cake. What if I told you it was my husband's birthday on Monday? Yeah. <laughs> and I happen to be able to see him. He works 20 days at a time, but I ha he happened to have eight hours off on his birthday where he was able to come home. And I made him the cake that he had wanted. We're dairy-free, okay? Dairy-free, sugar-free, and gluten-free. <laughs> Try making a dessert. <laughs> it's not easy. So I learned how to make dairy-free ice cream that was also not made with refined sugar. And he was just so excited and we sat and we had a piece of cake together. And it was an opportunity for us to be in communion with each other. What was the disposition of our hearts? It was in the right place. And so eating that piece of cake was not a sin. It was actually a morally good thing to do. <gasps> Eating cake can be a morally good thing. Okay. <laughs> this is, that's it. That's the end of my talk. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm going home. So what I want you to do is, one of the things we actually need to do is we need to throw away this list of behaviors that we have already made judgments about as good and bad. And we need to look at those behaviors objectively and say, is that actually sinful in and of itself? Now, there's, there are some things, absolutely, that automatically, don't, don't do it, right? We have that list, fornication, <laughs> right? Idolatry. There's, there are things that are 100%, they're gonna be sinful and they're never morally okay. But most, of what you're going to be doing on your day-to-day -day life, the action and the behavior in and of itself has no moral, it's, it's morally ambiguous, you might say. It's why, why you're doing it, what's motivating you, okay? So what we need to learn to do is actually take a step back and, and actually check in with our hearts and what's motivating us to do what it is we're doing. Because God is not interested in empty gestures. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Matthew 15. Blessed is the man who always fears the Lord, but he who hardens his heart falls into trouble. 
When we fall into trouble, it's a pretty good sign our heart is hardened. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. So we're going to be learning to look at what's stored up in our hearts. Because that is ultimately the only thing that's going to get us to where we need to go. But here's the good news. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. We have to let our hearts break a bit. Experience contrition. And God, God will take that. So let's just talk about disposition for a minute. What do I mean by disposition? Now, how many of you have heard of the, the whole idea of like sin being a term from archery? Uh, lift up your hands if you've kind of heard of that. Okay, a pretty, a pretty fair chunk of you guys, so I'll just kind of go over it again. So the word sin, it's a term that comes from archery, and it means missing the mark, okay? So the bullseye, right, when you miss your bullseye, so whenever we, and this is what we're doing actually when we sin, we're trying to hit a good, okay, but we miss the mark. We end up not doing the right thing. Now, if I'm telling you, if, you, if you're, let's say you had a coach, and they were standing beside you, and they were trying to teach you how to, you know, do your bow and arrow, what's the first thing they're going to tell you to do if they want you to aim properly? Any guesses? Your feet. Where are your feet pointing? Same thing if you're trying to shoot a basket. Same thing if you're trying to throw a ball. Where are your feet pointing? This is what virtue is. Virtue is a disposition. Where is your heart pointing? Right? If I had a target over here, and my feet were pointing over here, and I had a bow and arrow, would I be able to hit my target? Not unless there was, I was really, really good and I had like a bouncing things off of the ball, the walls or something like that and hit my target. It would be a miraculous. It would be a miracle. I wouldn't be able to do it. So when we're struggling with habitual sin, we have to look at our feet. Where's your heart pointing? We often get stuck on the behavior. We know that we shouldn't be doing the thing. So we tell ourselves, don't do the thing. Don't do the thing. <laughs> but behavior is not actually the problem. Behavior is the fruit. Behavior is the end result of what's in the heart. It's a consequence of the disposition of the heart. This is a somewhat imperfect analogy, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it anyway, so just like work with me here. If you had a garden or an orchard, okay, you've got tons of fruit trees everywhere, and you've got this disease that spreads, but it only spreads when one of the, one of the diseased apples falls off the tree and onto the ground, okay? What would you prefer to do? Would you prefer to make sure that you're picking all the apples off the tree before they fall? Or would you just rather get rid of the tree? Which one would you prefer? Get rid of the tree. But what do we do when we focus on behaviors? We keep picking off all the apples. Guess what? More just grow. <laughs> More come back. Why? Because we're not getting rid of the tree. <laughs> It's exhausting, right? Do you ever feel like you're banging your head against a wall, going to confession for the same thing over and over and over again? It's, it's exhausting, and it leads to all kinds of emotions. We can start to feel resentful, angry, frustrated. We relapse, right? We're, we kind of bounce back and forth 
between, yeah, I'm going to do it, to I'm so exhausted I can't do it, and then we get feel revigorated and we try again, and then we're back to being exhausted and not being able to do it. We start to experience a lot of shame. And then we, we start to despair. That's not what God wants for your spiritual life. Does that sound like that's what God wants for your spiritual life? No. He wants you to have the fullness of life. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. But we don't feel that most of the time. And again, that's partially because we haven't really been taught how to actually go about tackling an issue and a problem in our spiritual lives. So the goal of virtue, okay? The goal of virtue is not, I don't want you to think about starting and stopping a behavior, okay? The goal is to have your heart transformed by God. When your heart is transformed by God, the behavior becomes much easier and even desirable, okay? These are little two, I'm not sure if you can see them very clearly, but I've got a hill on the, well, on my right, so on your left, and it says, I want, okay? And the kids are biking down the hill, Wee! right? Going down a hill, why, it's easy, it's fun, it's exciting, why? Because that's what I want, I, what I want to do, right? It's so much easier to do what it is you want to do. And then there's the hill beside it that says, I should. All the things I should be doing. I should be doing my homework. I should be doing the dishes. I should be doing the laundry. I should be nicer to my husband. I should call so-and-so. I should be praying a little longer. I should be reading my scripture. But it's an uphill. Here's the interesting thing. Think about it. What makes it easy to do what it is you want to do? It's easy because you feel like doing it. You're in the right mood. So it's easy to do what you want because your emotions actually fuel. They, they give you fuel for the behavior. And this is what emotions are supposed to do, okay? When our emotions are properly ordered, when our heart is properly ordered, our emotions actually start to fuel us and we start to want to do what we should be doing. Imagine a day in the life <laughs> where all the things you know you should be doing, you actually wanted to do them. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> Way less exhausting. Maybe we start to understand where that fullness of life might come from. How much joy we would have in our day-to-day -day lives. How that yoke could be easy and that burden could be light. Would the things change? Would the behaviors change? Would the actions change? Would the duties change? No. But that desire within you to do them is what makes it easier. And when our emotions are improperly ordered, right, when our heart is turned to the wrong place, that's when we feel like we're carrying 100 pounds. That's when doing the dishes, even though it takes 10 minutes and it's really not that hard, feels like it's the end of the world. <gasps> I don't want to do my dishes. I want to watch Netflix. I want to scroll on my phone. I don't want to go to bed. I'm exhausted but I'd rather read my book till two in the morning. I don't care if I'm gonna be grouchy tomorrow. So the good news here is wherever you're struggling with habitual sin can actually become a compass and it can point you exactly to where it is your heart has not yet been transformed. Where in your heart have you not yet encountered God fully? Where have you not let him in? And this is exciting to me. Because 
What happens when we share our heart with someone? When we share a piece of our heart with someone? Intimacy. It's an incredible experience to feel safe enough to be vulnerable and to expose yourself, to expose an interior disposition that's happening in your heart, to share your emotions, to share your heart with another person, and to have them love you and accept you, hear you, and understand you. That alone often is all we need. <laughs> like you, right? Normally, like when you're feeling a lot of pain and somebody just hears you and listens to you and understands you, that pain lightens a hundred times. And you feel like you have a strength and a capacity to face it. And so when we're trying to grow in virtue, okay, because I'm going to be getting really technical about emotions in their next two sessions, but I want you to remember, like we're learning the technicalities, okay, just like you might learn how to play a scale on the piano, but we don't want to stay at the scale. We want to play a melody, okay? And in order to do that, we have to learn that the technicalities of our emotions, what we're doing in the next two sessions, we're just learning more about our own hearts so that we can share our hearts more effectively, right? You can't tell somebody why you're sad if you don't know why you're sad. So we're going to work on discovering our own hearts, working with God to discover our own hearts and what's going on in our own hearts, what's pulling our hearts away from him. Not so that we can take control. <laughs> it's going to be a temptation, I can guarantee you, okay? Not so we can take control, but so that we can share it with God and ask him to enter into that place and with us, with his strength and with his discipline, reorient our hearts. Okay, so never doing this on our own, always doing it with him and letting him actually lead you in that. If you're anything like me, that's hard because... I like to get down to business right away. I don't like waiting. <laughs> okay, so your heart, if it's not aimed towards God, okay, where is it aimed? It's aimed at what you love. Wherever your heart is pointing, it's whatever it is you love. Okay, and we love what we judge to be good. Every time you feel the emotion of love, underlying that emotion is a judgment. You have judged something to be good. You cannot actually move towards something that you do not believe is in some capacity good. You have not been designed that way. God has designed you to move towards the good who is the good? God. He has literally designed your entire person for him. For union with him. And to desire him. But the fall. <laughs> right? Like, I mean, the, the reality is, is unfortunately now, things aren't working properly. And so now we've got this tug of war happening inside of our hearts. A tug of war at our hearts. Okay? Because our flesh, which is where the emotion of love is, okay, the emotion, not the virtue, just some distinctions there, wants what the flesh believes is good, and the will, which is also designed for what is good, wants what the will has judged to be good. Technically, the intellect makes the judgments, but the will confirms it. So now we've got this tug of war. The flesh against the, the soul, right? The spirit against the body. 
We've got this thing that's going on between us, and we feel this battle all day long. That is the battle between I want and I should. Right? We, it's like we know what's good, and we know like maybe what we should be pursuing, but there's something that's pulling us away from it, or that's making it difficult to do. And that's because what's interesting is as I've been studying kind of just the structure of how we've been designed, our bodies and our soul, and how they intersect, how they kind of interact with each other, what I've realized is the, the physical aspect, our bodies, actually mimic our souls in a lot of different ways. It's just uh, kind of a lower version, and we call it a lower version because there's a lot of limitations in the body to the physical world that you don't have in the spiritual world. The spiritual world is higher than the physical world. And so the soul is supposed to be the boss of the body, and the body is supposed to follow along the soul. The soul's supposed to give it directions, and the body's supposed to say, yeah, sure, like, let's go. And that's what it was like in the garden before the fall. Can you imagine your emotions always following your intellect and your will? <gasps> Freedom. <laughs> that sounds amazing. That was what we call the gift of integrity. And that was lost at the fall. Here's the good news. God gave it back to us when you were baptized. But he didn't give it all back right away. It's a gift that we have to grow and we have to participate in. And acquired virtue is how we do this. And what happens when we grow in acquired virtue is we're actually bringing our bodies and our souls back into proper order. So virtue helps to heal the relationship between the body and the soul. And when we have perfect virtue, okay, when we have acquired all of the virtues, we start to experience an ease in doing the right thing and doing the good thing. And we start to experience an ease in it because now we desire it. And we desire it for God's sake because we desire God more than anything else. He becomes the only and sole focus of our hearts is to be in union with God. And so what we want to do is bring that back into working order because that's what's not working. Is the flesh, okay, the flesh can bind the will and the intellect. That's, that's part of the effects. Okay, so the, the flesh does not tell the will and the intellect what to do, okay? It just ties it up so that it can't work, so that it can't do what it's supposed to do. Have you ever felt like you were tied up to a wall when you're trying to do something good and you're just like, oh, like I know that God's calling you to do something, but it's like I feel like I can't, like I can't move. That is what happens to us spiritually when our emotions are disordered, when our hearts are placed in the wrong direction, okay? What we want to do is untie. We want to loosen those bonds. And we do that through acquired virtue, and we do that by growing in what we call detachment. Now, we are not Buddhists, okay? <laughs> The goal here is not to feel nothing and to think of nothing. That is not the goal. When you grow in holiness, the more you become a saint, the more deeply you will feel. Think of Mary. Think of Jesus. How deeply did they feel? More deeply than any of us have ever experienced. So the goal here is not to get rid of our emotions, okay? The goal is to have our emotions follow the intellect and the will. And in big part, that's going to come when you know God and you love God, okay? Think about literally anyone that you just, that you love. Your heart hurts when their heart hurts. You know what they're thinking. You know how they're perceiving the situation. You know how their heart is being moved. 
you've, you've grown in intimacy with this person, and so now your emotions are actually being moved by their experience. That's what happens when we come to know and love God. The more we come to know and love God, the more we start to understand the way he thinks, the, way we, the more we start to understand the way he actually perceives a situation, what his heart is desiring and what his heart is suffering, and our hearts start to be moved by this because we're so in love with him and we're so captured by him. This is what the saints were like, right? I mean, we can see it in them. They're just so captivated by God. They love him so much. Everything they do, like that's all they can think about and everything they do is, it flows from this love. And so our attachments really are what are keeping us from that because you already have that capacity within you. We talked about that yesterday. When you were baptized, you were given perfect charity. Charity is to love our neighbor and God for God's sake. Literally, to do everything because we love God. You already have it. It's already there. What we want to do is get rid of the kinks. Okay, and our attachments are what are kinking the holes and are keeping that from actually flowing out of us. And so the way that I describe attachments, okay, and this is, this is my own uh, definition, okay, is to love something only in as much as it allows you to love God. So when I look at that piece of cake, I judge how good that piece of cake is completely and solely dependent on how much that piece of cake allows me to engage my whole person in an act of worshiping, in an act of loving God. That becomes my motivation. One of the reasons we need detachment is because we actually need freedom to use the things of this world the way that God wants us to. And when we are attached to the things of this world, we don't have freedom. And it's harder for us to do God's will because we're being moved by these things. But detachment is like being able to like hold something in the palm of your hand, just flat. God can take it out. He can place it back. He can take it out. He can place it back. You're just like, cool. Whatever you want, Lord. Your will be done. It's an open palm. That is what will allow you, if God is calling you, let's say, to be wealthy. Is being wealthy a sin? Can you imagine if there were no wealthy Catholics? <laughs> We'd be in trouble. <laughs> okay? Wealth is not sinful, but is your palm open? If God blessed you with wealth and then took it away, would you be devastated? Are you clinging? Are you grasping? We need detachment so that we can be open to whatever God wants to give and take away, bring into our lives, take out of our lives. Here's the other reality to this. God wants you in heaven. So God will take away things in your life that are moving you away from him. He will allow you to suffer that loss. He will allow you to suffer that difficulty because the cost of your soul is not worth it. It's not because he wants you to suffer. He wants you in heaven. But our hearts are so darn fickle, aren't they? <laughs> We're so easily moved. We want to worship something, but we're so easily moved to the things of this world. And so God has to keep that in mind always. I read scriptures, and there's parts in scriptures where you just, you start to see how excited God is for the resurrection. Like, he's just, he's so excited because he has so much he wants to give us. Like, he just wants to literally pour it, like, just, and create all kinds of cool new things and, and totally, like, blow our minds with 
all this creativity that he has inside of him. But he can't right now. He can't because we will actually start to worship the things that he's created because they would be so wildly splendorous. And so he has to hold back for our own sake. So we want to grow in detachment. We want to grow in the ability to allow God to give freely and to take freely and to be able to be at peace. Okay? And peace, spiritual peace, is not a lack of emotions. It is not a lack of emotions. Mary, we call her Our Lady of Sorrows. She was the most sorrowful person in the world other than Jesus. She never lost her peace, ever. She was always peaceful. Peace is what happens when there's no tug of war, right? There's no more war happening between the body and the soul. That is the fruit of peace, okay? So it's not the lack of emotions, it's the proper ordering of emotions. This is a scripture verse. Um, you know the Pharisees, they were always trying to trap, trap Jesus in his words. And so one of the Pharisees had come to him and said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depends all of the law and the prophets. Those two commandments, it's the perfect virtue of charity. Everything flows from that. The entire law, when God says, when he talks about his law, his law is love. That's what it is. It's always about love. It's about intimacy, it's about transformation, and it's about union. And our attachments keep us from being in union with God. Our attachments keep the gifts that he's given us from operating fully and freely in our lives. Our attachments, they're, they're what get in the way. And so we really want to learn how to discover what they are. And we want to learn to say, Lord, I love you more than... Lord, I love you more than I like to sleep. Lord, I love you more than I like to stay warm and cozy. I love you more than anything. Whatever that attachment is, Lord, I love you more than my own life. That's what the martyrs did. I love you more than... This is the line that I want you to remember, okay? Whenever you are being faced with a challenge, with something you know you should do, but you don't want to do, okay? That your flesh is kind of pulling you. It's not about shaming yourself and guilting yourself into that behavior. That's not of God. That's not what God wants. Can you imagine being married to somebody and the only reason they were nice to you was because they were afraid that you would be mad at them? Not a great relationship. Fear and anxiety and guilt the whole time. It's not generosity. God wants generosity. And that's a really good sign for you, okay? If you're starting to feel shame and guilt, check in with yourself. Okay? Who's moving your heart? Because it's not God that's moving your heart if that's how you're feeling. When God moves your heart, you're going to feel an expansion in your heart, and you're going to feel a generosity, and you're going to feel freedom. And spiritual perfection, okay, is ultimately to love God with all your hearts. So it's to have no more attachments. To have no more vices is to have no more attachments. It's to be healed. Vices, you can actually replace that word with wounds. I think, like, we, we kind of have this idea with vices, like, right, they're bad. <laughs> vices are bad, and, and we almost start to attach our own identity to it, like, I'm bad because I have vices. Mm. No. Vices 
are not who you are, they're what's blocking who you are. They're what's tying up who you are. Your vices are not who you are. And that's why God wants to get rid of them. So that you can become fully who you were created to be. And so our vices, our wounds, they wound us. Our sins wound us. They wound our intellect. They wound our will. They weaken us. And so when we grow in detachment, what we're actually doing is we're growing in attachment to God. That's really the goal, is to grow in attachment to God, to feel totally secure with God. And you can think about this a lot like how kids become attached to their parents, securely attached to their parents. If there's a kid playing on the playground, you know, mom's not too far away, and he's having fun, it's great. Then there's a big, loud train that comes passing by, and the kid gets scared. What does he do? Mom! <laughs> Runs to mom, jumps in her arms, nuzzles into her neck. Mom just holds him, patiently waits with him there until the loud noise passes. And then he kind of like starts to peek around. Is it safe? <laughs> Am I good now? Yeah, oh, okay. And then he kind of wiggles out of mom's arms and goes back onto the playground. This is how we can use our emotions to grow in detachment. By growing in attachment to God. When we start to feel scared, when we start to feel pain, when we start to feel literally anything, run to your father and share your heart with him and sit with him there. Right? The last thing you want when you're sharing your heart with somebody is for somebody to, okay, and we have, we've kind of done this with the, with the word, offer it up. <laughs> it's very dismissive, isn't it? I mean, there's a truth to it. We do. We want to offer up our suffering, but not too quickly. Not too quickly. First, we want to go to God with it and let him engage with us there. Because when you go and you share your heart vulnerably with somebody, do you feel like you've grown in intimacy with them if they're trying to fix your problems? No. You get annoyed because you're like, you're not listening. You're not understanding. Go to God, sit with him there until you feel understood. And once you feel understood, you'll, you'll feel a sense of peace. And then in that sense of peace, you will be allowed to, to grow in generosity, okay? Because you're not going to be acting out of fear and guilt anymore. But you're going to be, you're going to be acting out of security and out of peace. And so we are going to be learning a lot about our emotions, but this is really the goal. It's about intimacy and it's about transformation in relationships. So how do we discern our attachments? Okay, I want to talk quickly about what the flesh judges to be good. Okay, how we make judgments in our flesh. And you are going to see this in every piece of marketing you will ever encounter from here on out. <laughs> Okay. The flesh loves what is pleasurable, pleasing, delightful, okay? What's useful or convenient makes your life easier. And what protects you from harm. So when you find yourself in self-protection and trying to self-satisfy, self-satisfy, okay? Or self-reliance, that's your flesh. That's moving you. Okay, which also means that your flesh hates anything that is unpleasant, anything that is inconvenient, and anything that you perceive as harmful. Now, just because something is convenient does not mean it's bad and it does not mean that you can't use it, okay? Think about a fridge. Who here uses a fridge? <laughs> Praise God for fridges. 
Have you ever thought about what life would be like without a fridge? <sighs> or a freezer? I mean, okay, in the wintertime, maybe it wouldn't be so bad, but those hot summer days, fridges, freezers, dishwashers, washing machines, electricity, it's very convenient, it's very useful. Is it sinful to have a fridge? No. <laughs> okay, so when we're paying attention, we're just paying attention, okay? You, you don't judge something as bad because it's brings you delight, or because it brings you convenience, or because it protects you from harm, right? Your winter jacket is good. It keeps you alive in minus 35 days. But we want to pay attention to how these three things are moving us, especially when we're feeling stuck, or when we're feeling like what we should do is hard, then we want to kind of look back and go, okay, what's making it hard? Okay, because it's, it's always going to be because the flesh somehow has convinced, not convinced the intellect, but it's, it's holding, it's holding your body basically captive. And I won't get into the details, but it does impact the way we make intellectual judgments as well. Okay, so intellectual judgments, just so you know, they're about moral goods. So they're the complex judgments. So something being healthy, for example, that's like a higher judgment. You can't, it's not, it's not a basic, it's not a basic thing. You need to actually use a higher degree of intellect in order to make that kind of judgment, right? And, and make a judgment as to whether or not it's good for you. Whereas the flesh, it's kind of think of animals, okay? Animals have this because they are also flesh and body. So they, dogs can experience delight. <laughs> pleasing, you throw a treat at them, whoo, they're happy, tails wagging, okay? They also experience fear. They also want protection from harm, okay? So that's the basic, that's the basic stuff. Anything that we do that's beyond that, you're actually using your soul to make those judgments. It's not your body. Your body is, your soul is using your brain, and it's using your brain as a tool to help you make those judgments, but it's actually your soul that's doing that, okay? Modern psychology and the modern world is gonna tell you that's all happening in your brain, okay? Nope. All your brain can do is hold an image. It can hold a picture in your head and it can make these basic judgments as to whether or not something is useful, whether or not something is pleasurable, delightful, and whether or not it protects you from harm. That's it. That's that's your capacity within your body. Everything else is your soul that's actually doing it. We discover our attachments by paying attention. It destroys something that you love. If something is being destroyed that you couldn't care less about, you have no emotional response to it. You're indifferent. So even hate tells us we love something which is really interesting. So that's what we're going to be learning to pay attention to. So the rest, the next two sessions today, we're actually going to be going through the different emotional movements that happen in our hearts. And we're going to, we're going to start learning how to kind of go backwards. It's like, okay, if I'm feeling angry, how do I kind of start to search backwards to discover what it is I actually love here? What's causing, what's my attachment? What's the actual root of my love here? And why am I experiencing this emotion? And we do that so that we can share it with God, so we can share our hearts with God. And after, that's when the acquired virtue comes in, okay? That's when our actions come in. It's funny, because the song that they sang today, More Like Jesus, right? If more of me, or if more of you means less of me, take everything. 
Now, when you're singing it with a really beautiful melody, your heart's kind of moved, and you're like, yeah, take everything, Lord. I love you. This is great. <laughs> now imagine saying that in the middle of a difficult temptation and saying, Lord, if more of you means less of me, take everything. That is what acquired virtue is. Acquired virtue is in that moment where our flesh is trying to order our heart and pull our heart away from God. We experience mortification. That experience where we feel like we're dying feels like, you know, we use that expression all the time, I'm dying, this is killing me, right? When we live in that ache of what it is we want when we're trying to not do what it is we want. Here's an interesting fact about your body. There is a part of your body that's actually dying when you do that and when you're feeling that. Because all of your habits are ultimately going to imprint themselves into your brain in some way, they create what we call wiring. And when you do something habitually, over and over and over again, okay, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. So you go from like a, you know, when you've like a, you kind of have this like little walking path in the middle of a, in the middle of a field, you kind of know where you're going, okay, so that would be like a small habit, not a really big one, a little bit easier to fix. But when it gets thicker and thicker and thicker, it's like a seven lane highway. You can get in a car and you can go really fast. So that's actually what starts to happen in the brain when you start to create a habit, good or bad, okay? The body starts to dispose you to that habit, it starts to make it easier and easier and easier for you to do that thing. Not only that, your body loves when you repeat things loves it and will actually release chemicals to give you an experience of pleasure and delight, to reward you for doing that thing again. Okay, this is supposed to be good. This is supposed to help us <laughs> because God created you and he gave you the stuff inside of your body to help you grow in virtue to help you build new habits, to help you learn. Virtue actually becomes delightful when your body is habituated to it. Your body starts to reward you for doing virtuous things, which is why one of the, one of the reasons why virtue becomes easy as you develop it. Just like a habit becomes, a bad habit becomes easy when you develop it. We do have a bit of an inclination towards the bad unfortunately. So we do have to keep working on that. So when you are mortifying yourself and you are living in that ache, okay, when you feel like you're dying, what's happening is your brain is actually screaming at you because it wants, it wants you to fire up and send an electrical signal through that wiring, right? But you're not, you're not giving it what it wants and it is like a pouty two-year-old, and it is having a fit, and it's saying, but I'm dying, because that connection is actually starting to die in the brain. It's starting to wither away. And so there, there is an actual physical death that is happening when you mortify your body, okay? And you're slowly but surely removing and allowing those pathways to die off, and it's making space. You have a limited capacity in your brain. You actually have to make space in order to learn something new, in order to replace, okay? So that's where mortification really comes in, and that's where a part of growing in virtue feels really awful, and it feels like you're dying, because you actually are dying. But that's also, now that you know that, okay, now that you know that, when you feel the ache and you're like, oh, this is so hard, you can celebrate. Because you're like, yes, that bad habit's dying. Good off. Go. Bye. I don't want you anymore. OK? 
okay? Now you know, you know there's actually a good there. There's a good there and you know it's temporary and it'll pass and you can celebrate because you know that you're getting, you're progressing and you're getting to where it is you wanna go. And that is what we call being crucified. We do not wanna reject our flesh, we want to crucify our flesh. Well, oftentimes we try to reject our emotions, which is in the flesh, we have to crucify them. Now that sounds really awful, but what happens after the crucifixion? The resurrection. When we crucify our flesh with Christ on the cross, always with God, always with him, never alone. We join him on the cross and we prepare for the resurrection of our emotions. Then he is able to bring them back properly ordered and that's where that freedom and that joy and all of those fruits of the spirit come in. So it's not about rejecting the flesh, it's about crucifying it. When he says, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me, right? The act of ex knowing what our attachment is and denying ourselves and saying, no, Lord, I love you more. I want to love you more. Pick up your cross. Embrace what you're feeling. Don't try to get rid of it. Just embrace it. I am really angry, God. I'm filled with rage. But I accept, Lord, how I feel. And I am following you. I am taking this emotion and I'm giving it to you, Lord, and I'm, I'm just following you with it. This is really what we kind of need to start to learn to do and just inviting God into that process. And slowly but surely, your hearts become transformed, you start to love God, and then all of your emotions start to follow along. A strong will is the ability to persuade the emotions. Right, so yes, there's a part of the strength of will that's the ability to choose the good despite the emotions being really intense, right, to be able to choose that, to live in that truth, but when your will is really strong and you've gotten to that place where you've, you've developed a lot of virtue and a lot of strength in your will and in your intellect, what's going to happen is you're going to be able to persuade the emotions. So it's not going to feel like a fight anymore. It's going to feel almost more like a conversation. And then the emotions just kind of, oh yeah, okay. Like a good leader, right? A good leader can come and he can scare you into doing what he wants you to do and he can push you to doing what it is you want you to do, or he can convince you and persuade you that it's actually good, that what, what he wants you to do is something that you also want. And then you start to work together. And it's a much, it's a much more peaceful environment at work when you have a leader that does that. And that's what we want to start doing with our will. So our next two sessions, we are going to be learning the different emotions, we're gonna, we're gonna stick to 11, okay? We could go into all kinds of stuff. We're gonna try and keep it as simple as possible. We're gonna stick to 11 emotions, okay? I'm gonna give you a general overview of all of these emotions, but what I'm gonna want you to do is that reflection that I gave you yesterday, okay? Go through that reflection, just kind of, Bring it to the forefront of your mind before we start doing this examination for these next two sessions. And as we go through emotions, you can kind of just jot down a note of just kind of like, uh, yeah, that's the one. That's what I'm feeling in this situation. So that you can go back and review it. Because you're not, we, you cannot take every single one of these emotions today and become an expert at it. So what we want to do is kind of go, okay, what emotion am I actually struggling with the most here? Which one's the one that's kind of holding me captive? And so we can start paying attention to it and we can start taking that to prayer, okay? And then there's going to be reflection questions that again are not there to help you control your emotions in a sense, but they're there to help you reflect. They're questions you can ask God in prayer 
so that God can start to reveal your own heart to you. Because remember, you can't know your own sin without God's grace. You can't know your own heart without God's grace. So none of this can be done fruitfully without God's grace. So all of this needs to be a prayer. And boy, when you start to learn how to pray with your emotions, never a dull moment in prayer ever again. Never ever will you run out of content <laughs> for your prayer life. You will always know what to pray about. And honestly, if you know anything about St. Ignatius' spiritual exercises and his 14 rules, if you can learn to take St. Thomas Aquinas' emotions and his definitions of emotions and pair it up with St. Ignatius' practical application, that is going to like rock your spiritual life. I, I think it's amazing. Okay, so we're just going to end in a prayer for today. And then I'll reach back to you guys in the afternoon and we're going to start delving into all of the emotions that start to come after the emotion of love. Okay, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for all of this knowledge that you have given to our church through your saints. And we pray that you give us all of the graces necessary to increase in awareness, in awareness of what is going on in our hearts, in awareness of what it is that we love more than you, Lord, and that you give us the strength to love you more and the desire to love you more, that you bless our intellect with the capacity to know you more and to know ourselves and to abandon ourselves completely to you. And Mother Mary, we ask always that you hold all of these intentions in your heart, that you pray for us, that you purify them, cleanse them, and bring them to our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, Rita here. If you have found this content valuable and helpful for you, please, I am here to humbly ask that you subscribe to my channel. I cannot tell you how much that little subscription, that two second click from you, can help this ministry to grow and help get this content to more faithful Catholics who are waiting to hear it. Thank you and God bless.